about. We'll call this special <coughs> workshop meeting the Jacksonville City Council to order. Uh, we have a uh, proposed agenda in front of you for tonight's meeting with four items on it. I'd, move, I'd entertain a motion to uh, approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. <coughs> First item is the 800 megahertz update and Dr. Woodruff. I'll Afternoon, you. Mayor, members of council. Uh, tonight we do have four items we would like to give you an update on. The first, we're going to ask uh, the chief to give you an update on the 800 megahertz. Then we're going to talk about task assignments that you may want to have included in your 2000 uh, FY, uh, six, let's say, I guess it would be 16 budget. It's hard to believe we're already talking about that. Uh, we're going to talk about the capital improvement program and the fact it's now ready for you to begin to do your review. And then we're going to give you an update on the waterfront work that John and others have been doing relative to the conversion of the uh, boat ramp and facility on this side of the river. So we'll start off with Mike giving you an update on the 800 megahertz, please. Mayor, Council, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk about the 800 system. Um, the reason that we really wanted to give you this update is because we, we have been delayed a little bit in the project. The project initially was supposed to be uh, fully implemented in October, and it looks like right now our target date is February the 17th, when, when uh, our project will be um, completed and will be transitioned to this new 800 system. But there's some things I'd like to talk a little bit about. This is the, uh, you know, we had, we had five towers right now, and those are, all those towers are operational. In fact, the county is operating on the 800 system right now. So we've kind of divided the system. There's some issues associated with that, and that, that includes the capacity. Um, because the city has most of the licenses, we have not transitioned those licenses to the new 800 radio system. So it, what, it, what it does is it reduces the capacity that the county can use for the system. So we've been really pushing Motorola so that we can transition and fully operate this system uh, because, because of the fact that they have added the, count, the county sheriff, the county volunteer fire departments, and the smaller municipal police departments to that system. It, it becomes very crucial for us to go ahead and implement the system. Now, part of the problem that we've had, um, this is the current, uh, the, our current coverage. <clears throat> this is the coverage that we're looking at right now. That, that lighter area is going to uh, really increase our coverage. And that's about 95 to 98 percent coverage with portable radios in all those white areas. So we're really pleased about uh, some of the preliminary testing that we did. Um, we have delayed the testing, and the testing will be delayed until like the springtime because the leaves are on the trees. The leaves actually do affect the radio coverage countywide. So we've delayed that cover or delayed the final testing until that is complete. Now we've done some preliminary testing. Uh, we've sent uh, fire and police units out all over the county, all within Camp Lejeune, and we've tested the system. Now that's important to us because of our automatic aid and our partnership with the uh, fire department on Camp Lejeune. So we have really great coverage the stairwells inside inside Naval Hospital as well as Onslow Hospital, inside the schools, inside some of the major buildings countywide. So once this system is fully implemented, a first responder, whether it'll be a, a city of Jacksonville first responder, whether it'll be a county first responder, or whether it'll be a Camp Lejeune first responder, will have about 95% coverage in all the major all the major buildings within the county and within most of the county uh, area. One of the things I think that, was, uh, that we needed to really talk about, just, just kind of touch on, is the Merle Brown site. The Merle Brown site, we had some water issues, it took us some time to get it up, and that, that was part of the delay. But that, that tower is up and operational, so, um, so we're, we're moving forward. The other thing, too, is that we have finished our radio installations. All the first responders within the county 
uh, are within the city and the county have had their radios installed. Um, what we did is, is one of the things that we worked on is coordinating this project with Camp Lejeune. Camp Lejeune is in the, mid in the midst of upgrading their radio system. So one of the things that's happening is the 17th, they're transitioning to their new radio system, we're transitioning to our radio system, and we'll have that interoperability or that, inter that, that coverage that we needed. And I think this is, this is really significant. It's significant, uh, I was talking to Dr. Nall with uh, installation-based safety and security, and we'll be the first DOD um, community that really is interoperable with, uh, with the base first responders. So we're excited about that because it, it's going to mean a lot for us. You know, firefighters, where we were, we were using a, a patch system before, firefighters, whether, they're, whether they have the city of Jacksonville or Camp Lejeune's uniform on, will be able to communicate very robustly in any of those fire situations or any of those emergency situations that occur. Um, and same with, uh, same with PMO. If we, have, if we have a pursuit or we have an incident that occurs, an active shooter that occurs in the city or, or on Camp Lejeune, we'll be able to switch to frequencies and communicate very clearly with our counterparts and we think that's going to have a, a tremendous impact on, on the way we do, we do business moving forward from the 17th. Before you change that, for the audience, I know the council understands the abbreviations, but for the audience that may be seeing this, would you explain what the abbreviations stand for? Yeah, PMO is, is the military police, and MCCL is, is the Camp Lejeune Fire Department. So this system will give us really robust communications between those and I, and I think with our automatic aid and the the way that that we've been working with Camp Lejeune um, working to get the first responder whether it be a Camp Lejeune or Jacksonville fire first responder to to a scene quickly um, I think this is going to have some major impacts to the quality of life of the citizens not just for the city but our entire community Chief, I have a question in regards to, you said the system that we have was a trunking system. Is that also in the 800 megahertz? Um, they're, they're, they operate on a different, on a different band, band, but they have bought multiple band radios. <clears throat> so basically when Camp Lejeune operates with us, we're going to be talking on our 800 system. Okay. So every first responder within, uh, or every first responder within Camp Lejeune in the city of Jacksonville will have the capabilities to talk on a bank of frequencies so they can communicate robustly with each other. Will it still be trunked or is it digital? It will be. It's digital. It is trunked. It's still trunked. Trunked and digital, right. uh, not analog signal. Right. Okay. The, the, the trunk system, what, what the trunk system does is, is there's a band of frequencies and it pulls a frequency out and communicates under that that particular frequency. And what we've been able to do with this system to make it more robust is divide those frequencies. So it's given us more capacity. So we feel like that we've, we've got this uh, quite a bit of capacity. We've got quite a bit of redundancy. We think this system is going to be very, very uh, um, robust at least for the next 10 to 20 years to, to be able to communicate with both Camp Lejeune and in the city of Jacksonville. To help, to help me and everybody else understand this better too. All right. Before what we we're still having to work off different frequencies, right? That's so if correct. I want to talk to, say, like if uh, uh, base PMO wants to contact us or vice versa, it's going to have to be on a certain frequency. It's not on a it's not on an open frequency, right? Um, I think yes. It, what it what it does is. What we've done is we've created talk groups, mm -hmm. and these talk groups include a bank of different channels. So what it does is it gives us the opportunity, for example, uh, PMO. PMO will be able to communicate with us on our main channel. Our main channel. Okay. okay, because we thought that was very important. So if uh, we're pursuing somebody or they're pursuing somebody, they'll be able to communicate with, with those first responder units. So if a PD car wants to talk to a PMO car, how's that going to work? 
what, what if a PD car wants to talk to a PMO car, they'll be able to to uh, because their system is is scanning back and forth. They'll be able to go and and simply call and ask for whatever PMO unit they want, and they'll communicate that way. What we also did is we also put we're also putting uh, portable radios in each of the guard stations, um, and that's and that's to help us. You know we. We had a, a homicide a couple years ago, and one of the things that happened was uh, the dispatcher had to call their dispatcher who put out the, uh, the description of the car, and that car was stopped at the main gate, and the suspect was arrested. Well, now that won't have to happen. What will happen is the, the unit on the scene, the PMO that's at that gate, will be able to hear that, that broadcast come out, and it will be more real time. Rather than going from dispatcher to dispatcher to unit, it's it's real time. It's from that patrol officer on the scene right to that uh, right to that person. So that's my my next question. If they're on the main channel, then you both can hear the traffic from each other's operation. Right, right, and, and we think that's going to help them with their security. Yeah. You know, because if if they should know if we're stopping a car who has a, somebody has a potential gun on Highway 24 near there. And, and we think that's going to that's going to uh, bolster their security. So they'll know that they can send a unit out if they want to. They can communicate with us. Who is that? Why are they there? What are they doing there? Um, we we think it's going to make us more more seamless as far as providing safety to our community. But there's no real concern as far as talking over each other. No, the, because the system is so robust, I don't think you'll have that problem. Because one of the things that you can do is the same with the current 800 system. We have a bank of channels, those event channels. Switch if we had a special switch. event like 4th of July or you know, the Beirut the Beirut Memorial or anything like that, we could go and, and actually communicate on that uh, channel. You just have them switch to that channel right. for that event. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how basically how the fire department will operate. Um, what what what'll happen is if, if we have a major fire, whether it's on Camp Lejeune or here, we'll go to one of those event channels for the fire department and all, whether it's, a, whether it's a county fire unit, whether it's a city fire unit, whether it's a Camp Lejeune fire unit, we'll be communicating on those, that event channel for whatever, whatever uh, tactical operation they'll be operating under. Is there a limitation on the number of channels? There is a limitation on the number of channels, but the system is so robust, we, I, don't, I don't think we'll ever, uh, at, at least in, in my lifetime, I don't think we'll ever reach its capacity. Well, let me ask you, how long do you plan on living? <laughs> <laughs> digital is the newest technology yeah. that will be out there for a while. Yeah, and, and there's, always the, there's always the ability for us to uh, expand that system. And I think it's important to know that, you know, we're, we're real pleased with this system and, and, and the reason is because of the redundancy involved in it. We actually bought two brains of the system and the brain is, is part of that system that pulls those frequencies. One of those brains is located at, uh, at the Center for Public Safety, one of those is located at the EOC. If one goes down, the other will pick up and, and we won't lose any communications. If one tower goes down, uh, the towers will redirect those signals, and so it's it's a it's quite a robust system. Chief, so, are those towers generated? Do they have? Yeah, they have the, they have <laughs> generators. They have they have of course they have commercial power, but they also have generators, and, uh, at each of the sites, two of those sites are located on city property. The rest are located on county properties been a long time since we've been working on this. It is. And Five years, man. Yeah. yeah. It's, and uh, we're, we're excited about the, the quality of, uh, you know, because Motorola has guaranteed us that within the city that we'll have between 95 and 100 percent coverage with portable units, which is something that we've, we've struggled with in some of the areas like in the hospital, in the mall, and uh, in the jail. I don't think I would count on the technology lasting for 25 years. <laughs> I, I, I think you're right, Mayor. I, I, you <laughs> know, as fast as technology, <laughs> that'll be as, as fast as technology changes, I don't know what it will be in the next 10 years. So I remember last time we purchased or, or did an upgrade, we were guaranteed 
so many years out and I, my adding and subtracting it don't come up to what they said so <laughs> yeah. that's lasted a pretty good while though hasn't it yeah 15 50, probably 15 uh, years that's 15 a good years, span yeah. and th this was this was the original project timeline and the the reason for that slide was just to emphasize the fact that we that we have been delayed to about four or five months which which affects the testing so the testing won't actually the formal testing won't actually start until sometime in April and this interconnection is really a great thing though. it's something we've always wanted it and that you know in the public safety business finally getting it yeah, yeah it and uh, we've had we've had some discussions with the base fire department too about how we're going to improve our our delivery of uh, you know whether we respond to to some of their housing areas or whether they respond to some of the city areas and I think the interconnectivity of the radio system is going to really enhance our, our ability to provide services for our citizens and the state patrol they're still on that old Viper <coughs> system right they're, they're on the Viper on system but uh, actually the the highway patrol is part of our uh, part of our our agreement so we'll be able to communicate with the highway patrol as well ALE SBI NCIS um, secret service all those agencies will have uh, will have communications with them when we're working interoper interagency operations I mean, Viper's an 800 megahertz mm -hmm. system. Viper's an 800 megahertz system, yes. <clears throat> the only thing that's really looming out there that we have not uh, solidified is this connection with um, Jones and Lenore County. Uh, we're still working, the county is still working out those details. <coughs> but uh, the reason I wanted to kind of mention this one more time is to keep this in your in your mind is um, we're working on a partnership with them where that they will buy into our system so that we can communicate or they will use our brains to communicate because our system is so robust it doesn't have anything to do with the number of frequencies that we use or how we use them the brain th that really just pulls those frequencies out is has enough capacity to use it for a number of frequencies so what we're planning on doing is is using those brains, those two brains, to communicate with Jones and Lenore, or for Jones and Lenore, and we've we've saved them some money, and part of this communi part of this uh, agreement will be some cost sharing in, in our system. So we we hope that that uh, offsets our costs in both maintenance and you know the costs that we invested into this system. Is there any collaboration or partnership for Pender County? Pender County operates on their own system right now. Pender and, 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 uh, and New Hanover have both upgraded their systems in the last little bit. But, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that you ask because Surf City, which is located in Onslow County, part of it is located in Onslow County, is actually going to be part of this system as well they're going to be able to communicate they're not they they work off pender county system it's a it's a relatively new system but um in order to 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 have this interoperability um surf city pd will be able to commute will be able to communicate with them as well so i'll be glad to enter, entertain any questions let me clarify one point on uh, uh, when it comes to accepting the system we want to make sure that when the vegetation is back on the trees that's why you know mike mentioned that we are delaying it. it's delayed for several reasons but the primary reason why we're pushing off the the final inspection and making sure that it meets all the specifications is because it's winter uh, we understand that leaves do cause interference so we are postponing that until we get full foliage back on the second thing I would like to take a moment is to also recognize the fact that while Mike has been the leader of this uh, activity for quite a while, Chris Coltick, who is sitting here in the audience tonight, our IT director, 
Ron Massey, the deputy manager, and then of course Earl Bunning when Earl was with us. A lot of city employees have put a lot of time into this, as with county employees. There are many times when people don't see the city and county working well together. Here is a great example of how working together, investing our money together, and I think the final cost of this was close to what run 14, 13, yeah. close to 14 million dollars, where we all are investing the taxpayers' money together for the benefit of all taxpayers and all residents of Onslow County. Also, for managing this system, I'd like to have Ron talk to you for just a second about the comm board that they have. So, Ron, would you explain how we manage the system? <coughs> if you recall, uh, Council, when we, when we entered in the agreement with the county to share in building the system, we also created the comm board, which is a joint city-county board, three members from the county, three members from the city, that actually will oversee the operation of the system. And of course, you know, on our current system, we actually ran the system and the county operated on it, whatever units were on the 800 megahertz. So we're used to kind of managing our system and that's why it was important for us to jointly manage with the county because, you know, some of the functions that we want the system to perform may be a little different than, than what the county, how the county operates. And so you know, the comm board gives us the ability to basically jointly manage, you know, how the systems, you know, operates on a day-to-day -day basis, the planning for, you know, redundancy or, or upgrade and things like that. So Who does the comm board consist of? It's a deputy county manager, uh, the uh, their emergency manager, county's emergency manager, and their director of communications. On the city side, it's myself and uh, the chief, and we have uh, fire, the deputy fire chief. Question. Yes, sir. Chief, you keep on mentioning how robust the system is, yet I get the impression that while waiting for the final test because of the interference with foliage on the trees, is that a critical element in a test, or is there some sort of contractual specifications? There, there, there is. And, and is that a concern right now? Well, Motorola has guaranteed us so much coverage, for example, 95% coverage in the city. And there's, there's kind of a, if, if they can't provide coverage, for example, one of the things that I was very concerned about was the stairwells at, uh, at the hospital. Because in the stairwells, there's a lot of concrete there, there's a lot of metal there, and, you know, firefighters use the stairwells if there's a fire. So, I don't want a firefighter to pick up his radio and say, I need help and not be able to communicate. If they can't communicate 95% of the time, then Motorola has guaranteed us that they will come back and they will fix that building so that it has other communication. And that may be putting a, a specific device in those. They may be putting a specific device in Naval. That may be putting a specific device in one of the high schools or one of the elementary schools including the base. So we wanted to make sure that we had that coverage, whether it was, whether it was in, for example, the jail, you know, and they already realized that the jail, because of the concrete and the metal involved in that, that they had to put these devices to have that communication. Well, that's reassuring. I thought you were going to say we'd have to start cutting down some trees. <laughs> no, no. And, and, but but by that, we want to make sure, because they proposed the locations of those towers, and they said based upon the location of those towers, we'll have 95% coverage. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to do is if you're driving out toward Holly Ridge, and you're out in an area that's, you know, that's, that's kind of remote, or you're at the land application site, we wanted to make sure, hey, that we had that communication. So it's up to them to test it to make sure that wherever they go in, within the county, that we have that coverage. Okay. The other thing is by doing it this way, we're able to keep their final payment. There's nothing quite like having a financial incentive to make sure it works. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I, I understand what he means about the stairwells, but also elevators, because every oh, yes, time I talk yes, to sir. you from the school, when I get on the elevator, it drops the connection. You, know, you can't pick up the signal in there. Thanks. Uh, that's a very good... Uh, 
good presentation. Good presentation. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to it. Yes, sir. Yes. We'd also like to take a moment tonight to talk to you about uh, the task assignments. On the 20th of January, we had a workshop where we gave you information regarding the upcoming budget. At that time, we asked you all to give us thoughts about some tasks that you may want us to accomplish. Several of you have made comments uh, to me. I have to admit, I was expecting 60 or 70 tasks to come in from you, uh, 10 from each of you and 20 from Mr. Willingham, who, by the way, is not with us this evening because uh, of some personal commitments. But uh, we did want to look specifically at some things that came out of the summit. This may be some things that will give you, uh, let's just say, a stimulus to suggest some things. We know that in the summit there were 24 changes that the community recommended. Those that received very low votes, three or less, were better shopping. So I'm going to ask you as we go through this, do you want us to do anything regarding economic development other than continue as Ron and staff does to work with the EDC? Are you comfortable with what we're doing and, or should we be doing more things to attract? Are you finding any problems with our permitting and building and planning sections that we can improve so that we can uh, have a better quote-unquote reputation as far as being a developer-friendly community? Well, if you were to do additional EDC economic development activities, I mean, what kind of things would that involve? Well, that's why we're asking you all those questions. <laughs> you know, one, one you thing that up. <laughs> one thing that we have that we have thought about downtown, and I don't know whether we can afford to do this, but maybe it's a task that we ought to at least research. Is this when you come into the downtown area, you're building, you're rebuilding, you're not building new. There are costs to converting a building. Maybe what we could do is look at setting up a limited grant program so that we could give, you know, pick a number, $5,000, $10,000 if someone was actually putting a new business into the downtown and something about our codes were requiring that person to do something that would otherwise, they would say, well, if I've got to do that, I might as well go out on Western. And I'll give you an example. A lot of these buildings downtown, you're going to have to put sprinkler systems in. You're not going to do that for five or ten thousand dollars. On the other hand, if you had the ability to get a grant from the city to at least offset some of that cost, I'm just trying to plant some seeds to say, are these things that you want us to research to see, uh, you know, are there good ideas here or are there not? Well, the thing, in my mind, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, I think EDC does a great job for our county, our region, uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty much uh, set with the responsibility of looking out for our own, you know, self as far as downtown. At least that's always how I felt, you know, uh, it was. You know, we did have a program at one time. Remember about 05, 06, we had that downtown loan program. The banks got together. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 240000 or two. It was $200,000, and it was low, low interest. Mm -hmm. uh, low interest, and it was to use, you know, to be uh, non-repayable on some conditions, I believe. There was uh, basically some employment or something over a period of time. It was forgivable. Is that right? I don't think that there was. No, they had to pay it back, but it was over. It was over a stretch period of time, longer amortization, providing at a much lower rate, providing the they provided. The city it, did provide a grant program for mm -hmm. signage, I think, for new businesses located. Mm -hmm. But if we do this, if if it's acceptable, we'll put that down as a task, not with any specifics, but we'll put down as a task of bringing back to you some ideas on how we could incentivize people to locate downtown. Well, you know, just like, just like with the situation down there that we were looking at doing along the riverfront there, you know, it, it, the marketing the land over here, you know, possibilities over here at the old Onzo Insight, these are things that we, we probably need to actively pursue. Because, I, I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think that's something that's going to be carried, you know, 
the way we want it to be carried, you know, at the county regional level, you know, I think we will do a better job doing that ourselves. We'll put you know, that down as, as some ideas. I could ask Carmen if you could probably uh, look back in the record and get information on the downtown loan program, and it, it was around that 05, 06 time period. If you could get some, some of that for council to look at and, and uh, it's senior it's staff. It's earlier than that, I think. And to tie into that, I think we need to, if that's what we're talking about, is to, to sort of get back to those tasks that the downtown group sort of the realigning of the road and some of those ideas that were infrastructure related, you know, power lines and some of the improvements that um, were part of the suggestions made for the downtown redevelopment. The streetscaping. Um, streetscaping. Uh, okay. When it comes to cable, uh, cable options, uh, not necessarily something that we are in, but I will mention to you that uh, Chris and, and Ron and I have been having some discussions as recently as this morning. As we reinvest <coughs> in our water and sewer systems, while we're not in the cable business, what you may want to consider doing is installing what we call dark, uh, dark, uh, what's the term, Chris? Dark conduits. Conduits, thank you. One of the problems that we're having, and we've had several just this last week or two, is the contractors that are in town boring and putting in the underground cables, they are causing a lot of damage to our water and sewer system. On the other hand, if we are doing a major project such as the one that's in the capital improvement to extend a major uh, force, force main across the swamp from, from Gum Branch all the way out to 258, if we put dark conduit in there, we have the ability to lease that conduit out and charge an annual fee for someone else who's in the cable business. We might look at that on some pilot projects around town. Now, where would the money come from? I would suggest that the money would come from the water and sewer fund and the revenue go back to the water and sewer fund because why are you digging the hole? It's for water and sewer. But it's a concept that, if you're comfortable, we will do some exploratory thoughts on. We're certainly not talking about uh, digging up every street and putting conduit in. That would not be realistic. Is there other advantages there to our uh, citizens? Well, the number one advantage to our citizens, Mayor, is that we're going to hold down damage to our own water and sewer lines. Uh, we don't know how many. We know those that have been reported. And just this past week, we had a water outage where a cable contractor drilled right through a force main, a water line, even though we had located it correctly. Are they insured against it? Yes, them? and they're going to have to pay us back. The, the problem, though, is that inconvenienced hundreds of people and several businesses for two days while we had boiled water. You're never going to get away from that. The ones that we're most concerned about, though, are those sewer connections that we haven't found yet where those cable companies are boring and they're hitting them and we'll only find it when a couple of years go by and we have a major cave-in. So there are benefits. But again, we're not talking about laying you know, uh, a dark conduit over the entire city, but just where opportunities uh, exist. That's something probably worth exploring, you know, the cost-benefit there. And, of course, one of the things that was mentioned was a city Wi-Fi. And I have to admit, I have no idea what Wi-Fi mm -hmm. actually is, so someone else here can probably explain the pros and cons, but that was one of the suggestions that came from the citizens. Is this you something that's been kind of choked off by the legislature a little bit? Haven't they? Uh, <clears throat> the broadband. The, the, oh, right yeah. now, the, the state law prohibits uh, getting into that business, but that's... There's a case at the FCC that stand, there's a good possibility those state laws will be invalidated. Isn't the reason why it's because the state's getting franchise fees for it? They, they don't want to well, get it it's the lobbyists for lobbyists. the, the lobbyists cable, for the cable providers are the ones that... But there's a couple communities that have it. I think Mooresville... Wilson and, and Lumberton. And Lumberton. That was all prior to right. the registration. They were grandfathered. Mm -hmm. But the reason I bring that up is they've been pretty successful with it. 
Uh, well, that's something we can just simply watch the uh, watch the court cases because I think it's going to be a while. And since we're focusing primarily on the task force 16, uh, we'll just simply monitor the court cases on that. By the way, somewhat yeah. related to Wi-Fi, cell phone usage, I was pleased to see that memorandum you sent out. Mm -hmm. Congratulate Chris in terms of the modification to the cell phone usage, saving us, what, $22,000 a year? $22,000 a year. Very good. Thanks, yes, Bravo. As part of the, the three E's, I know that, that email went out about midday, so maybe some of you did not see it. Uh, uh, several months ago, Chris began an analysis of all of our cell phone usage. And it's uh, pretty amazing how many cell phones we have. He has been able to negotiate a new contract with our provider, and we were up about 117,000 minutes a month. And we really, the historical numbers show that we use about 50,000 minutes a month. That's still a lot of minutes. That's what we were paying for was 117,000 up front. Yeah. So he has negotiated that down. The other part that we realized was that we have, we still have uh, one of my favorite phones, the flip phone. I mean, I always enjoyed holding that thing and flipping it open. And, Kind of like a movie star when you do that, Mayor. <laughs> but uh, we also realize we have several hundred of those flip phones. And we're paying for options on those flip phones. The primary reason the person who has that flip phone needs that phone is talking. It isn't texting. It isn't a lot of other options. So by Chris going in and working with all the department heads, uh, we are eliminating a lot of those options on the flip phones. And that will save us about $22,000 annually. Now, let's put one caveat on that. Almost every week or every month, some cell phone provider is coming up with a new menu. So all we're saying is that our current contract will go down $22,000 a year because of these savings. Now, three months from now, there may be some other program that comes up. And then who knows what's going to happen. But those are some of the three E's that we do, your staff does every day to try to hold down these costs. I guess we get a pretty good rate from them anyway with the volume, right? We're getting much better right now. <laughs> what about uh, one of the comments they said is we ought to work more to preserve history. Now, I'm not sure, Mayor, whether they meant, uh, you know, preserving me as your manager, which I hope is what they were saying. But when it comes to the history of the community. It's ancient history. <laughs> What was that, Mr. Bitter? Nothing. Nothing. You're well preserved, and you're also well preserved. Well preserved. I, I appreciate that. But when it comes to preserving the history, is there anything specific that you want us to be working on in the community to try to do that? <laughs> Increased tourism opportunities. Mr. Lazara, you mentioned to me the work of the TDA and what y'all are doing. Uh, any special task you want the city to be staff to be doing other than what the tourist development uh, no just uh, the continued support in our efforts to uh, increase our our heads on beds campaign and to bring more activities and tourism opportunities through sports and other venues to our community to, to enhance economic development in, in that manner I see where the uh, revenues are down a little bit the uh, occupancy tax which means uh, that less or is that or is that more specific to an area I think it's the reporting this time of the year is slightly down but but we don't foresee it uh, sustaining for the year I think it's maybe two percent like fraction of a percent wasn't yeah. it year to date that yeah. we're down very small one month I figure you yeah. and, and, and everything three, wasn't less percent I thought it was maybe geared towards the Western Boulevard area too as I recall reading whatever I read somewhere mm -hmm. so. it, it, it w during that report we didn't have everybody hadn't reported uh, well, we will also do if it's acceptable to council uh, we will ask Susan to uh, Susan uh, Baptist to work on any sports programs that she can identify whether they're runs in conjunction with the Sports Commission or others that can help us bring people in on a tourist basis. But I'll tell you, just before we end on that, we have a tremendous amount of, of new activities and runs, and um, every year we're just continuing to grow with particularly sporting events, uh, runs, 
that the sports commission is involved in. Uh, we've got a, uh, uh, I think the latest one was the uh, Krispy Kreme challenge that's going to be coming up. And that's not so based upon how many donuts you can eat in a minute. Well, you'll have to eat some donuts during the run. Uh, <laughs> Raleigh, so, Raleigh has that. So we continue. The color run was very successful. That was the first time for, for Jacksonville and Osceola County. So there's a lot going on. Back to history. You know, I think one of the things Jacksonville suffers from is a actually a, uh, a written record tracing the history of the city from its inception. And we probably lost some resources in terms of the Tallman brothers, who I remember spoke to a couple boards one time, and they recollect the boom days of Court Street and so on. But at least we should, and I know Carmen maintains excellent records in terms of minutes, but perhaps as part of someone's duties, we ought to compile an annual report of the highlights of the city and so we can create a chronological history of where the city was and how it prospered or what significant events during any particular year. And the other thing that I thought about while, while we're on this, with this back here to preserve history, is I don't think there's a whole lot made of the uh, uh, birth date of the city. About the what? About the birth date of the city. You know, the, the, the yeah, anniversary is the birthday of the city. You know, the city founded in 1849. Uh, well, we never make a big deal out of it. A lot of, other, a lot of other cities, you know, that's something they're part of their uh, civic pride, you know. Is, we can get Jerry to talk about, you know, his when they When they, when they organize, when they right? <laughs> I'm glad you have friends. <laughs> I was in a city that celebrated its centennial, and the local bank there commissioned a uh, a gentleman, a writer, an author, who researched the complete history and wrote a book, and presented the city, and the c people bought copies of it, the complete history of the city for those hundred years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stratton Merrill, his, his book, uh, that's really good. It's got a lot of the historical. In fact, maybe that's a good project for the tourism board. Commission someone to write the history of the city and talk to some of the old timers around here while they're still here and to get a flavor of what's, what's 1849. Okay. We can do that. What about major city events? You know, you have authorized us to sponsor three events. We think we do them well National Night Out the Winterfest and Jacksonville Jamboree. In addition to those, we have things such as Oktoberfest, the New River uh, Palooza, things of that nature. Do you want the city to be more involved in any additional major events? Are you comfortable in that area? I was asking the mayor, and I guess I'll, I'll ask it out loud for those of you that have been here for so long. Has the city ever had a 4th of July celebration within the city? Um, is, it, is it something that was ever done, or has it always been a county and a base? Uh, Everybody's been at the beach, yeah. so we haven't had one. No, I'm no. just asking that yeah. question. I think that's probably part, part of part it, too, of it. yeah. <clears throat> Um, well, also remember, part of National Night Out, the, the that ends with the fireworks, because I will. I have to admit, that the first year I was here, uh, I asked staff, you know, what's going on with the Fourth of July, and they mentioned, well, the base has historically taken care of that, and uh, then when I attended my first National Night Out, I was extremely pleased to see the great fireworks display that occurs there. We could certainly look at uh, making sure, though that there are events the 4th of July, not necessarily city-sponsored. Yeah, that's just a question. I know that that's a big day, and, you know, most communities have some sort of celebration, and I know we don't, or we haven't in the past, and I don't know if that was tried before and it didn't work, or... Our major event, our major annual event is that National, is National Night Out, Night Out uh, for sure, without any doubt. Then uh, I think we probably need to promote the Winterfest a little bit more. Try to get a little more you know, involvement with, with the community with that. I don't know if there would be any benefit in tying our, you know, we're named after Andrew Jackson. I don't know if there's any benefit to tying to his birth date or, or some significant event around him, but uh, just throwing that as a thought. 
we can look at that and see. And something else I thought about is, I don't think it's really, I don't know if it's right for a city major event or even defining that, but it seems like the landing has only been used for that one tournament so far. I mean, it's, it's brand new, but it seems like that'll probably be an annual thing. Mm -hmm. But if we could maybe just search out or more put it out there that. that we've got more potential for us good idea. fishing. And Randy, I surfing. think the Sports Commission is working on that. Oh, they got some? I think they've got a couple other tournaments or Something tournament online? people. Well, you know, one of the things that, we've, that we have talked, uh, you know, about is the possibility of setting up some uh, kayak races using yeah. the facilities that are there at the, uh, you know, for example, I can envision once a year in the spring having the city council and the county commission challenge each other in a on, kayak race. On, on Andrew Jackson Day. <laughs> on Andrew Jackson Day. We, we can do this. So I'm ready. Okay. Pizza and donuts to the winner? Is that yes. what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. I'm ready. Okay. I think you'll see more activity with the landing course. It's only been open since November. You know, it's, it, you know, it's been real cold. And uh, well, I, would tell I think you, in the summer, I think you'll see an ups, upsurge in activity. I go by there uh, almost every day, and there's only been one day since it's open. Even when it was 17 degrees, yeah, there were a dozen or more boats. Very out. rare there's no car. I mean, it's once in a blue moon. It's got to be awful weather or maybe that. Also, the major events, we spend uh, significant effort with the 9-11, with the Beirut Memorial. Want to make sure you all are still comfortable with the level of work we're doing there. Okay. Those things would not exist without your staff, without y'all's commitments. Do a great job every year. Protect the protect names of youth offenders. Now, this is one that I don't know. I'm just listing the things that were there. I don't know this is one that we need to get involved well, in. I think that's dictated by state law. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. the general statutes. And I think the police department, our police department, does a great job of, uh, you know, of course, to meet the standards for accreditation, they have to do that. They have to keep uh, separate their juvenile uh, records and everything. So I don't really look at that as being a problem. On expanding the trails and bike routes, uh, you know, Deanna did have the pre-bid conference last week. We had seven, I believe, Deanna, potential vendors come in for this last phase of the, uh, of the Greenway and Trail. Uh, out at the Commons uh, yesterday afternoon, I met Jack Kane, and we we're looking at expanding the challenge course out there so that it will come down into the wooded area closer to the water tank and, and using that. Uh, other areas, though, when it comes to trails and bikes that you want us to work on? Yeah, I'd like to see us uh, go downtown and, and perhaps even go across and go over if we're going to continue with the Beirut Memorial over on the Camp Geiger side of, of the of the city. Let's see if there's something we could do there. Maybe bring it downtown a little bit more. To, you know, we, we don't really have a, a starting point. I mean, well, maybe we've got several starting points, but could we make a starting point at the Riverwalk, for example, and, and tie into there? Can we go uh, somewhere along the, the bypass and go out towards the Beirut? Memorial that way, or the Grove, excuse me, when I say the big Memorial, I mean the, the, the Grove itself. We can study and, and bring back some suggestions for that. Now they've actually got it marked. They've got a mileage marker on it that starts from um, Cheney. Uh, Johnson Boulevard, yeah, or maybe it's Cheney, because it's, it's right on the path. It'll say, you know, uh, three miles. Is that? Five miles. Six and a half miles from the intersection where, where Cheney turns off to Cheney. You begin Railroad Street from there sure. to the main gate. Six and a half. So it's a 13 mile. Any, any, any possibility of expanding it back over towards uh, uh, Commons area over there along the, the parkway right away? Is there something we could look at there? We'll, we'll give you better plans. Solicit visit to solicit business to support urban communities I think we're we've already discussed that one uh, more leadership engagement in lower income communities I think you all are doing a good job being involved in the Alza community ministries efforts in the, uh, the new river new river area so okay. one thing that could be considered 
and I know we've done this in the past is to have neighborhood meetings you know uh, try to uh, get those organized you know in various areas of the city to sit down and have dialogue with you know the people that you know the people that are going to show up for the meetings are probably your leadership in those communities and, and to be able to establish dialogue with them and you know get concerns from them or ideas from them I think that would be a, a very uh, good gesture on the part of, uh, of the city to, to to solicit that type of uh, engagement so yeah I think if we if we change this a little bit just simply say more leadership engagement throughout the community where you we certainly want to be involved in the low-income neighborhoods but we also want to be involved in everywhere, everywhere. Yes, so we'll, we'll look at some thoughts on how we could do that encourage business expansion to other areas I think we we touched on that a little bit uh, those that got four and five votes and we're going to because of the hour we're going to speed this up just a little bit we've talked about better relationships with the county anything special that you'd like for us to do there other than what we're doing every day I, I think what you're that? doing now is working really well I think that things have improved quite you know appear to have improved quite a bit so you know we just got to keep doing and it's never been a staff problem I don't think you know it's been more of a you know well it's ideal, been, it's been issues. ideal uh, differences it's been issues from time to time but you know y'all have taken the leadership and <coughs> that relationship back with the County Commission and I think things are good more parking downtown we're already you know we've reported on that anything other than the things that we've already reported on will be tearing down the uh, tax office uh, once we get the uh, easement in from the county we expect that to be this summer um, better control of housing development now this is one that uh, while the while the advisory committee talked about it I would remind you unless you're going to take the power of zoning you really have very little ability to tell the free market that they can't build houses so anything here other than just looking at individual zoning petitions better traffic control I think y'all are doing a good job there um, anything in that area you want us to work on how's the signaling system doing everything running well sure. yeah, not getting any bad backups or anything well no, we, not, not <laughs> well we had that one uh, about 10 days ago in Western and uh, in gum branch because we ended up uh, having some failures in the signal box and that, that but but they replaced that whole signal box and were able to put in uh, additional timing patterns one that puts a protected left turn in going off a of gum branch into Lowe's which is a safer movement in that so uh, was that something we did locally or is that something we had to go through the state's contractor on some things we have to get approval but we go get that approval while we're getting ready to do it and then yeah, there's since we don't have an actual traffic engineer there are some timing changes that have to be stamped and approved by a, a traffic engineer improve infrastructure that's something that your capital improvement program uh, works on every day uh, we're going to talk about the capital improvement program in a minute but when it comes to uh, you know some of the uh, infrastructure beyond water and sewer uh, anything special that you want us to be working on there yes well, according to the paper the other day we need paved roads in Sherwood <laughs> Forest <laughs> pave the roads in Sherwood Forest. Yeah. Okay. I took the manager down one and he's got it on his list it's on it's definitely on that list Nottingham yeah, I mean there's a lot I mean where you do what you can with what you've got you know and that's that's Quicker street put it on so we Same talked time. about that <laughs> those getting six to ten votes <laughs> increase recreation YMCA uh, and so forth um, you know I, I think we've we've hit on those when it comes to recreation city though forget the YMCA and, and YWCA uh, other than working on some of the programs what about uh, anything that you want us to try to get involved in in recreation splash pads swimming pools uh, yes uh -huh. I'd like I, I brought this up with you I'd like to see us work on getting a splash pad somewhere in the city uh, in the FY 16 get something under a belt it might be that it works best there at uh, 
uh, over there in the, the New River area at, at, at the school. We've already got it in a plan to do some splash pads over there. That might be our first best place to do it. So. And, and I think later on you're going to find another slide where they want to increase water activities in, in That's uh, true. the city. So. And of course we're, we're doing a lot of things. One of the things that we are going to need to provide for you this coming year is an assessment of the boardwalk out at Northeast Creek. Uh, I know we all toured that a year ago. We have not had the money nor really the time to get on that, but we need to give you a comprehensive assessment of that boardwalk. And do we advertise that, uh, that they can fish down in Sturgeon City off that boardwalk? Is that, I don't know that I've seen anybody do that. I, I don't think we I don't do. I, I don't know. I'll check yeah, and see. I don't know whether Wilson Bay Park is a good place to fish. Well, I'll tell you, uh, two Sundays ago, Gwen and I rode our bikes over to Wilson Bay Park, and the fisher people were out there. Now, I didn't see any catcher people. I just saw <laughs> fisher people. <laughs> so. Worm drowners, huh? Yeah. Uh, lower taxes, um, you know, that's one that wouldn't we all. Is, is difficult. Increased industry and manufacturers jobs, we talked about that to a degree. Uh, those getting the most votes, uh, public pool got an awful lot. I don't think we're ready to invest in a public pool, but if we do things like a splash pad and things of that nature. I think we, I think we need to get splash. a splash pad under our belt and see how, how well it's received and how we feel about it. It may be something that we might want to expand if it works well. I'd agree, splash of pads. Civic Convention Center, uh, you know, we, we discussed what we're doing in that area. Uh, any other comments on, on those? Improve older uh, develop, improve older developments, sidewalk streets, power lines, and so forth, you know what we're doing there. Now think of anything else that you want us to be working on on task. Okay, real quickly, what we'd like to do is cover two quick things, and we'll take a, a we'll close this session out. Deanna's going to come up and talk with you about the capital improvement program for FY 15, uh, 16, and then John's going to give you an update on the downtown waterfront. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we have uh, finished putting together the draft CIP booklet or the capital improvement plan for your um, review. We've uploaded it as part of your agenda packet for this evening. It can also be found on the city's website under the, um, the Granicus G10 link for those who are watching. So just real quickly um, to review for those who might not be familiar with what the capital improvement plan consists of. It's a five year planning window for the city to identify projects that are a need or um, infrastructure that desires replacement. It shows us the cost or expenditure estimates and it also identifies probable sources of financing. So this is, again, tonight's is just to give you um, um, kind of a very brief overview of what the CIP looks like for this, for this funding year, which is FY16. So as you can see, we've got public services taking the large pie of, of the expenditures, followed by recreation and parks, community programs and transportation. This represents a, just over $10 million in proposed expenditures. And of that $10 million, we have three major projects. The Sturgeon City Civic Environmental Education Center, the uh, Lejeune Trails and Greenways Project, as well as the Parkwood Regional Lift Station. And on the other side, this is the proposed funding source summary for those the $10 million projects that I just talked about. And again, the majority coming from the Water and Sewer Fund, then we've got Powellville, which consists of our streets and our sidewalks. We do have a little bit of a Marine Corps base Camp Lejeune funding for um, a water line extension and a little bit from PL 104 for some um, planning work and transportation. So out of the FY16 proposed projects, you can see the majority are, again are from public services because we are coming in and either um, replacing infrastructure or adding new sidewalks or rehabilitating streets. We have um, a few projects in recreation and parks. The one in community programs is the Sturgeon City and then we've got four projects in transportation 
out of all these projects, only seven projects are new that have never been in the CIP before, and all seven are found in the Public Services Division. Um, and so for those of you who might feel more comfortable having a hard copy of the CIP booklet, we do have those available. Um, and I think we also have it in a, in a PDF format that has some bookmarks that makes it a little bit easier to navigate through the 110 pages or so. Um, our plan is to come back in um, a few weeks at your discretion and to kind of review the CIP in a lot more detail. And then, of course, you'll adopt the CIP at the same time you adopt the budget. So, now, we will make, based upon comments tonight, we will modify the book so that at least one splash pad is in the FY16 uh, proposal for you. John, if you will talk for a moment about the downtown waterfront. <coughs> Before I start that, I want to correct one thing I said is, I said Lumberton and Wilton, it's Warrenburg and Wilton that are the two cities that I'm aware of that have cable uh, franchises that they offer cable services to their citizens, but both of those were uh, authorized prior to the legislation that we're speaking about. I want to take a moment, as Richard said, and talk to you about waterfront land update. and. <coughs> The location here, and I have a map coming up, but is the Ann Street Waterfront District, which of course contains a parcel owned by the county and the city and the former wildlife landing. And here's the, uh, the map that gives a better representation of that area. The blue is property that is city-owned property, and the green is the property that is county-owned property. Now, the county owns further property up this way, but these two parcels of land are covered by a federal um, LWCF grant that we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Uh, the blue, of course, is the former wildlife uh, landing that the, the city had leased out to the, the wildlife folks. What's the acreage on that? Both spots? I'm not, I don't have that okay. on the top of my head. Right. Okay. Yeah, maybe an acre and a half. Yeah, I would, not, I, much. Yeah, not, not much. The, uh, on January 28th, uh, the county manager, the county attorney, Richard and I, met with John Poole and Tim Johnson, who are with the Recreation Grants and Outreach Program of the North Carolina Diener, uh, which is the Parks and Recreation Department there, and also met with a gentleman named Mike Christenberry, who is the, was a CAMA representation because, representative because CAMA has uh, a grant on this also. But clearly, uh, we came and, and met with them to talk about a, a process called conversion. Conversion meaning that there is a lifting of uh, a grant from this property to another property. First of all, let me give you a little bit of the history. The county in 1986 applied for this federal land water conservation grant. It was $50,000. Now, the county did not do that alone. The county worked with the city and the city uh, acquiesced and actually uh, uh, gave their blessings for the county to do this. And uh, of that $50,000, these are some of the items that are listed here that were the fifty thousand dollars was used for because remember the county and the city both already owned the land mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we don't have to look at in a conversion process finding equivalent land and we're going to talk about that in a moment but again it's important because uh we're going to talk about the bulkhead boardwalk picnic shelter and benches that also on this conversion process have to be um, duplicated if you will I think it's a fair statement to say that the federal regulations do not favor conversions. Uh, and I think you'll get a, a better idea. But again, all these gentlemen came to the table that day and represented to, to us that they would work with us in this process. I think it's important to understand that the Diener folks are merely ministerial folks. They would take the documents, the appraisals, et cetera, that we're going to talk about here in a moment, and we would submit it to them, and they would review it and say that you, we've met the conversion regulations, et cetera. But then it's their job to help us make sure that they're right, and you can put that in quotes, and then they have to send it on to the federal government to give the final approval. Uh, again, the real issue with these type grants is that it makes a permanent restriction on that property that it has to be used for recreational purposes in perpetuity, which is a pretty long time. Uh, so what are the challenges? Well, of course, the challenges is the council, uh, the county, all of us are interested in downtown redevelopment. Uh, 
and as part of downtown redevelopment you have limited waterfront available for any kind of uh, development and as you know from going to other cities uh, Wilmington etc waterfronts are like kind of magnets they actually attract uh, businesses which therefore of course attract people who like to dine and and you know to have rooms on the hotel or on the waterfront etc the uh, Wildlife Commission of course the ramp was closed and therefore you can't let boats deploy from there anymore that's restricted uh, and it's actually got a, 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 a barrier there where we don't let folks actually go in there because of that particular restriction and of course as we talked about the uh, the grant stipulations the uh, conversion process you have to do two things you have to show that the land that you're offering is of equal that equal or greater value than the land that presently have that we have so we're talking about here again the the county property that you saw on the map the green as well as the blue has to be the property that you would convert or put this grant on and therefore attach it in perpetuity for recreational purposes that it is of equal or greater value monetary or Mon recreational? monetary okay. and it has to be done by current appraisals and it has to be okay. looking at the land in a raw state okay. not with the improvements in addition to that the second part of this is you have to show that you are duplicating those facilities uh, boardwalk benches etc in fact a part of this dis discussion and of course we're talking about looking at the uh, the Jacksonville landing is possibly where the conversion could occur to and putting this perpetuity restriction of recreation on it but it, we talked about one of the restraints was well you don't have a bench like they have over here and this was the kind of discussion that we have uh, in, in that regard so you again facility wise you have to have uh, all of the not only the equal or greater value of the land but you also <coughs> have to have the facilities duplicated let me interrupt just Go a ahead. second there in an earlier meeting we reported to you that we were not able to use this facility because it had been developed prior I will say to you Senator Brown intervened on our behalf and he went to Diener and said mm, we got to use some common sense here in government that's why the Diener folks are now trying to help us figure the maze so that we can in fact use Jacksonville Landing as the conversion land so the good news is what John is leading you through is there may be hope that we can use the Jacksonville Landing land but it's not guaranteed please okay. thank you and again remember and, and I'll mention it again but this is a county city project we if we go down this road we're working on it together so the conversion process well again the, the land on this side of the river I'll call it county and city would have to be appraised the land on the other side has to be appraised has to be equal or greater and the county property on the other side of the river the ferries trailer park property there right beside the the, the bridge where they owned for a long time before we started acquiring those uh, properties that from the Beecham's and the Wallace's etc that cannot be included because that is always or at least since they've owned it they bought it with their purchase intent many years ago to make that a recreational purpose and that so again it would have to be the land that the city acquired has to be of equal or greater value of the county and city land on this side of the river okay so it may be that additional appraisals are needed plus they talked about a yellow page appraisal and you can put that in quotes of course we've always had uh, MAI appraisals I believe that they would you know meet that but again there's several things that have to be looked at there environmental assessment on the other side of the river when we bought from the Beecham's and the Wallace's and so forth of course we have environmental assessments and got issues of any uh, issues were cleared up so that again we got a clean bill of health there from our environmental engineer but we would ha that would all have to now be uh, an environmental assessment of the county property on the other side of the river plus there would have to be this would all have to be packaged if you will to meet the guidelines of the of the feds uh, additionally we would have to have an environmental assessment of the property on this side of the river both the county and the city so we'd have to get our environmental engineer to look at that etc surveying uh, the property on this side of the river would have to clearly be uh, surveyed out and of course we would have to you know see if the surveys that we have on the other side uh, are satisfactory etc 
there's a process application and preparation of documents. We have to pull all of the deeds and have copies of those uh, on both sides of the river. And the application to be released from the, not released, but to, to do the conversion would have to be made by the county since the county did the application initially. But on the other side of the river, the Jacksonville Landing side, it would have to be, of course, in the city and county's name also. Even though the county's land is not going to be part of the the equal or greater amount, it now has to become part of the converted property so that there's a recreational in perpetuity restriction on that land. Timeline, we believe 16, 12, 14 months. I will give you some anecdotal history that they gave us. They say these issues come up a lot with DOT. They want to put a bridge in them. They want to do something like that. And it's beside a park. They're working on one now that's going on for four years with the DOT in some part of the state. So it does, these things uh, do take a, a while. And it's not uh, because they told us, uh, and help me, Richard, if I missed, but I believe they said, as long, once y'all get us the paperwork and we say this is good, we'll have it out of our office within 30 days. We won't be your holder. But we can't assure you of anything when it comes to the federal government. Our recommendation uh, to you tonight, and get your buy-in, your consensus, if, if, if you want us to go down this road, is that we do go down this conversion process, uh, converting this property or putting the, the recreational uh, restriction on the Jacksonville Landing, and to coordinate the process with the county because they would have to be, again, 100% buy-in just like y'all would have to be. Assemble all the current documents, review and conduct any additional appraisals that might be necessary to make these numbers work that that on the other side is equal or greater. And I would just say that there are two different appraisers and two different time periods that these uh, occurred uh, uh, as far as the appraisals that we've gotten recently on this side of the river. Conduct the environmental assessment on this side of the river that's necessary and package that together. Uh, conduct uh, physical surveys and, uh, and, and move forward with this. We don't really have, I don't uh, think, a uh, an idea yet, I'm sure we're talking probably five to $10,000 as a, a minimum, just getting uh, the documents together. And uh, of course, we would give you uh, periodic updates, but we did want to tell you what we had learned from that meeting uh, from, with the Diener folks and the camera representative and, and get your guidance and, and thoughts on that process and be glad to try to answer any, any questions besides the number of acres of the land. Post me ahead as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Questions? Good job. Thank you. Everybody, anybody comments? Proceed. Proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay. That concludes the items we have, and we thank you very much. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. All favor. All right. Jeez.